Welcome to this next video in the playlist on ring theory. In this video what we're going to do is discuss quotient rings. Okay, now the concept of a quotient ring is very much so analogous to the concept of quotient group in group theory. Now in group theory what we do is we take a group and we quotient it out by a normal subgroup to arrive at a new group which we call the quotient group. In ring theory the analogous thing to a normal subgroup is an ideal. So what we're going to be doing is dividing a ring by an ideal. Okay, so what we're going to start off with then is some arbitrary ring, capital R, which we will insist is going to be a commutative ring. So R is going to start off as a commutative ring. Now let's say we have some ideal within this commutative ring. So let's say capital I here is an ideal of our commutative ring, capital R then what we are going to focus on in this video is how to quotient uh, our ring capital R by the ideal capital I to arrive at a new ring, which will be called the quotient ring, and denoted R over I, or R divided by I, um, which is a new ring uh, that in a sense is uh, what you get if you divide this ring by uh, the ideal. Okay, right. So firstly then, let me just remind you of what an ideal is. An ideal is a subset of the ring which obeys two criteria, and those two criteria are that it is one, an additive subgroup of the ring. Okay, so if I draw a picture for this then, so let's have our picture of the commutative ring, capital R here, and I'll just colour that in in green here. And let's put the ideal on here. Now the ideal is just a subset of the ring, first and foremost. So here it is. So here it is just shown as a subset then. And it must obey two properties. Okay, property number one is that it's an additive subgroup. Now the ring has two operations on it. It has an addition operation and a multiplication operation. However, if you just imagine getting rid of the multiplication operation, then all we'll have is a set with an addition operation on it which satisfies the axioms of an abelian group. Okay, uh, so you can talk very easily about additive subgroups within that uh, additive group, and that's what I mean by an additive subgroup. Okay, so all additive subgroups will indeed be normal subgroups within the uh, ring, because the ring is an abelian group as far as addition is concerned. Okay, so that's the first criterion that we want the ideal to obey, that it's an additive subgroup when you just think about addition. Okay, uh, axiom number two then, or property number two that we want it to obey, is that it's also closed under multiplication by other elements of the ring. So you pick any element of the ideal, so for all little a that you can possibly pick from the ideal capital I, and for all little r that you can pick from the ring, it must be the case that r times a is also an element of the ideal. Okay, now we're working with a commutative ring, uh, so uh, r times a is the same as a times r, so I don't need to put the second condition that a times r is also an element of the ideal, because that's exactly the same as r times a. Okay, so take any element from the ideal, multiply it by whatever element you like from the larger ring, and you must end up with something else that's back in the ideal. And we call this, uh, well, we say that uh, the ideal must be closed under multiplication by the larger ring, capital R here. Okay, so those are the two properties then that our ideal will obey. Now, how then are we going to construct a quotient ring? Uh, of the ring capital R by the ideal capital I. Well, this is going to be extremely analogous to how we construct a quotient group. Okay, so what we're firstly going to use is the fact that the ideal is an additive subgroup of the ring when we just view it as a group. So imagine getting rid of the multiplication. You've now just got this set of symbols with an abelian addition operation on it. And now I've got an additive subgroup of that uh, abelian additive group. Uh, and of course, that will be a normal subgroup because all subgroups of an abelian group are normal subgroups. So I can quotient the additive group associated with the ring out by the ideal and form uh, a quotient group. And that's effectively exactly what we're going to start off by doing. We're just going to form the quotient group and then stick a multiplication law on top of it, uh, which will use property number two that an ideal obeys here. Okay, and it will all work out beautifully. 
but what I'm going to do is start off by just reminding you of how you actually form an additive quotient group, so how a quotient group works. I won't just say let's form a quotient group and assume that you know exactly what that means. We'll go over it again. Okay, so how does this work then? So I would like this picture again, but bigger this time. Okay, so here is my commutative ring, so once again I'll colour it in in green here. Okay, and then I'll mark my ideal one as well. And what we want to understand is firstly, first and foremostly, what are the elements going to be of our quotient ring here? Okay, and they're in fact going to be the cosets of the ideal under addition. Okay, so let me just put this on here. So here is our ideal capital I here, which at the moment all that it matters is that this is an additive subgroup of the additive group associated with the ring here. Okay, so how then are we going to use this to generate cosets, or even what is a coset? So basically, this is why uh, this is analogous to division, because what we're going to do is split up the ring here into cosets of the ideal, and then the elements in the quotient ring are just going to be the cosets of the ideal uh, in the ring, uh, with uh, under addition, basically, the additive cosets. Okay, so how does this work then? Uh, so what we're going to do is use this ideal, which is an additive subgroup in our additive group associated with the ring, to partition up uh, our set uh, into cosets. And this partition is going to be well defined. So let me remind you of how this works. So let's say we have some elements, which I'll call little a here, which is outside of the ideal, and I realise this might be confusing because I used a as an element of the ideal up here, but I'm now just using this symbol, I love this symbol, so uh, we're just using it again here to mean something totally different. So a now is an element that is outside of the ideal, okay, so it's not in the ideal, it's some element of the ring that's outside of the ideal. Okay, and what I now want to do is form the uh, additive coset of the ideal uh, under the element A. Now, because the ideal is a normal subgroup, uh, or indeed because the addition operation on here is abelian, even better, uh, the left and right additive cosets are going to be exactly the same because it really does not matter which way round I add them together. So abelian is actually even better than it being a normal subgroup. Okay, so it does not matter whether I consider left additive cosets or right additive cosets. Now, I prefer the notation for left additive cosets, so we'll go along with left additive cosets. So, to form the uh, left coset uh, of the ideal under the element A, what I do is I take A and to it I add every single element of the ideal. Okay, so what I will be doing is I'll take A and I'm now going to add every single element of the ideal. And now I've changed my notation, so I'm now using little i to represent an element of the ideal here. Okay, so I go through every single element that you have in this ideal here, I add that onto A, okay, I get all of the answers here, so A plus every single possible element of the ideal, I collect those all up into a subset, because all the answers here are going to be in the ring, so it's going to form a nice subset of my ring, and this is what I call the left coset of the ideal under the element A, okay? Right, and uh, it can be shown, and indeed we do show it in videos in the group theory playlist, that all of the elements that we get in this left coset of the ideal under the element A will be distinct from elements in the ideal, so this will be a completely separate subset from the ideal. Okay, so never, when you do this, will you get an element that's back in the ideal. If you were to get an element that was back in the ideal, you can prove from that, that the element A was actually in the ideal to start with. Okay, so if A is outside of the ideal, this entire left coset of the ideal under the element A is completely outside of the ideal. Okay, the other really important thing about cosets is that you can pick any other element that's in this left coset of the ideal under the element A. So let's take this element here. So let's say this is 
A plus some element of the ideal. And if you were to generate the left coset of the ideal under this element, it would generate this exact same subset. Okay, so any representative from this coset here would generate the same coset, and that's really the gist of why we can partition up this set uh, into these additive cosets of the ideal because it really does not matter which representative you take from a coset, uh, they will all generate the same coset back again. Okay, so to give this coset then a name, to give it a symbolic name, the way that we usually name the cosets is that we take a representative, any representative you like, uh, I might as well take A here and stick a bar over it. Okay, so A bar means the coset that contains A, or the equivalence class that contains A, or the residue that contains A. All of these pieces of nomenclature, they all mean the exact same thing. Uh, equivalence class, coset, residue, whatever you want to call it, it means this thing. It means the ideal, uh, all the elements of the ideal added to this element A. Okay, so as I say, uh, there's a little bit of uh, ar arbitrariness uh, in the choice of notation here because of course you can use whichever element of the coset you like uh, and put that under the bar here. We might as well take A because that was the favourite element of this coset that we used but it didn't matter. You could have used whatever you like. Uh, now to add another bit of notation which I'll use later on, if we want to name the actual ideal then, well this is going to be the coset containing the zero element, the additive identity. Remember because it's an additive subgroup it will always contain the additive identity so we might as well call the ideal zero bar using this notation. Okay, and then you can go on. So what you'll then do is say, okay, either these two things completely cover the entire ring, or there'll be another element outside of both of them, let's call it B, and let's generate the left coset of the ideal under the element B. Okay, we'll call that B bar, and this again will be completely distinct from these two, otherwise if that wasn't the case you can prove that B was in one of them, so it has to therefore be completely distinct from them, uh, so their intersection is completely empty, and uh, again it will be beautifully uh, a beautiful structure because whatever elements of this coset that you pick, not necessarily B, pick any of the other elements that are in this coset B bar, generate their left coset of the ideal, and it will generate you the exact same set. Okay, so that's why this is forming a very nicely defined partition. And you continue this process on until you completely cover the entire ring. And in our picture, it looks as though you'll get uh, five cosets here to completely cover the entire ring. Let's call this one C bar, and let's call this one D bar here. Okay, and we'll colour them in, so we'll have a C bar in orange here, like so, and which colour have we not used? We've used yellow, uh, green we haven't used, uh, we can use light pink, but I'm not sure this will show up completely different from vivid purple there, but never mind. Okay, this is actually a slightly different shade of pink to B bar there. Okay, right, uh, so we've now partitioned our ring up then into this into these left cosets uh, of the ideal, and of course these left cosets are exactly the same as the right cosets, so these we can just call the cosets, or the equivalence classes, or the residues. And this, I will stress it again, is a well-defined partition, and what I truly mean by that is if I gave two people the job of splitting up the ring into uh, a partition in this way of subsets of the ring, okay, uh, according to the cosets of the ideal, okay, so I gave two people the ring, I gave two people the ideal, and I said go forth and partition me up the ring into cosets of the ideal. They would both come back to me with the exact same partition. Okay, there is only one partition that you can form. Okay, and that's because it doesn't matter what A, B, C, and D you actually chose to generate uh, these cosets. Uh, you could have picked whichever elements of the ring you like, and you would have still got the same cosets being formed. Because of this fact that any element that's in a coset will always generate that coset as its answer when you uh, ask what is its coset uh, for the ideal. Okay, so this is a well-defined partition. There's only one answer to how this ideal can partition up the entire ring here. Okay, so this is where the division analogy comes in, because we have sort of divided our ring up by the ideal and split it into these cosets uh, of the ideal. Okay, now, 
now we can talk about what the actual set that's going to form our quotient ring is going to be. Okay, so R divided by I, the quotient ring of R by I, as a set, okay, not as an algebraic structure yet, we're going to have to define addition and multiplication on it later, but as a set, it's just going to equal the set where the elements are these cosets. So what we'll do is we'll put in the coset 0 bar, A bar, B bar, C bar, and D bar. So the elements of the quotient ring are the cosets that you get when you partition the uh, ring up with the ideal. So let's just colour this in. So 0 bar will underline in yellow, A bar will underline in red here, B bar will underline in purple there, C bar will underline in orange, and finally D bar will have in pink there. Okay, right. So those are going to be the elements which we are going to actually have in this quotient ring. Now, if you like, you can actually think about the elements being the set, uh, well, the, the cosets themselves. These are symbols representing the cosets, but if you like, you can actually imagine this, instead of putting the symbol for this coset in, putting the actual coset in itself, so instead of putting zero bar in, actually putting the set that contains all the elements of that coset in. Okay, so you, if you like, you can imagine the elements of the quotient ring as actually being sets in their own right, which are the cosets here. So this will contain all the elements of this ideal here, and the element here of this quotient ring would be a subset of our initial ring. And the same for these, you can imagine actually putting in the sets as the elements of the quotient ring. Okay. Um, it can help in, with intuition doing that, however it becomes notationally just annoying, so that's why we will use symbols to represent the cosets rather than actually having the elements as these sets, okay? But effectively the way we're going to define the quotient ring is exactly uh, the same, uh, it's just a matter of taste whether you prefer to actually think of the elements of the quotient ring as being those subsets of the initial ring, or whether you prefer just to think of putting a symbol there to represent that subset of the initial ring, but the actual thing we're going to end up with is going to be identical, as far as algebra is concerned. Okay, right, uh, so now what we need to do is we need to define addition and multiplication on this set of elements to actually produce us a ring. Okay, at the moment it's just a beautiful set of elements, pretty coloured set of elements, but we need to define some addition and multiplication laws on this in order to actually make it into a quotient ring. Now the way we're going to define addition is exactly the way we did it when we talked about quotient groups. Okay, so in principle uh, you could just go back and watch the quotient groups video and then uh, know how to equip this with a good addition. However, I do want to repeat the argument here uh, for completeness. Okay, so uh, let's say how we're going to define addition of two cosets then. So let's say I've got a coset and we'll just have two arbitrary cosets, A bar and B bar. Okay, so I am now going to define addition in my new quotient group and I'm going to colour everything to do with the quotient group in in red here. Okay, so this is addition in the quotient group. I'm defining this. At the moment this is just a set of symbols, it doesn't have anything on it. I'm now going to define an addition law. I'm going to tell you how to take one arbitrary coset and add it to another arbitrary coset. Okay, so the way you're going to do this is you're going to go to the two cosets and you're going to take representatives from both of them. So A bar, this is a coset. Okay, here it is. You take any representative you like from that coset. The most obvious one for us to take is A, however, so I will put A down as our representative. But you could have taken any representative. Okay, and one of the first things we're going to check is that this is fine, it's well defined if you pick any representative. Okay, so I pick a representative from my coset A bar. So my first coset, I pick a representative um, and I've picked A simply because that's the most obvious one to go for, but it didn't have to be that one. Okay, and the same for my second coset, I pick a representative from uh, that coset, and again I will pick B, but you could have picked any representative. And I add these two together in the initial ring, and I'm colouring everything to do with the initial ring in in green, so this is addition in the initial ring. So A and B are both elements of the initial ring here, so I can add them together in the initial ring. 
okay? And then I will get some answer, which is A plus B here, and the answer then, as far as cosets are concerned, is just what coset does A plus B lie in? Okay, so maybe it lies in this coset C bar here, so maybe we've got A plus B here, okay, where A and B have been added together in the original ring in green here. So we've added A and B together, we've got some element in the ring, let's say it's in the same coset as C here, so it's in the coset C bar, so the answer here would be the coset C bar, or you could call that the coset A plus B bar, because of course this notation was arbitrary, you could choose any representative you like from the coset to name the coset after. Okay, so that is the way that I, I'm going to define addition on this set of cosets. Now, I'm sure you agree that it's doable. It makes sense. You can do this. You can take any two cosets and you can actually compute this. Okay, so it makes sense. But there is one huge thing that we have to check right away. One big pressing problem. And that's the pressing problem of is this well defined? Because you have said you can take whichever representative you like from the first coset and any representative you like from the second coset, add the two together, and then take the coset that contains that, the question is, will we always get the same answer? So if I give this job to two different people to add these two cosets together, will they both come back with the same answer? Well, the two different people might pick different representatives from the two cosets, so they'll add those two together, those different representatives together in the original ring, and they'll probably get different answers in the original ring. We want to make sure that even though they might get different answers in the original ring, those different answers are in the same coset, so that overall the final answer in terms of cosets is exactly the same. We want to make sure that this definition of addition is well defined in short. It doesn't matter which representatives you pick, it doesn't matter who does the addition. They both get the same answer. So, what I need to show you then is that if I take a different representative from my coset A bar and a different representative from my coset B bar and add those two together in the initial ring, whatever I get it's in the same coset as A plus B, which uh, was my answer when I took the representative A from A bar and the representative B from B bar. Okay, so another arbitrary representative from this coset A bar looks like this form, something of this form. A plus I, and I'll call that I1 here. Okay, so this is just an element of my coset A bar. So all things that are in the co same coset as A bar here are just going to be of the form A plus some element of the ideal. So I1, I should stress here, is just an element of the ideal. So here is an arbitrary element from the same coset as A. Okay, so that's fine. Now let me pick an arbitrary element from the same coset as B, that will just be something of this form, B plus an element of the ideal. So I2 now is also going to be an element of the ideal, so that should be I2. And this will be an element of B bar. Okay, so I hope that's all fine, that's all clear. So I've just taken two arbitrary elements from these two cosets, and I'm now going to add them together. So I'm trying to perform this addition. So I'm person 2, basically. This was the way person 1 did it. Now I'm person 2. I've picked my other two representatives from these two cosets. I add them together, and I should stress, these additions here are additions in the original ring, of course, because that's the way that we construct cosets. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, if I want to work out what these two cosets added together is equal to, I need to add these two representatives together in the initial ring. So I'll take A plus I1, and I'll add it to B plus I2. Now, I don't need to bother putting brackets in there, because we know addition in our initial ring obeys associativity, so we don't need to worry about that. Okay? In addition, we know that our addition obeys commutativity. So what I can now do is say, okay, this, let's just rearrange it. Um, so let's rearrange it into A plus B plus I1 plus I2. And now let's stick some brackets in there. Let's put a bracket around I1 plus I2. Now this is all still addition in the um, original ring. Now, let's take a step back and ask, what were we actually trying to do? Remember, we added these two together, and to get the final answer, we have to take the coset that that's contained in. Now, I need the coset, therefore, that this thing is contained in. Now, I would very much so like it to be in the same coset as just A plus B, okay? Because remember, 
A plus B was the answer that person 1 got, and they took the coset that contained A plus B. So I would like these two things that these two different people have got in the ring uh, R here to be in the same coset, so that the answer in terms of cosets is exactly the same, and therefore my addition is well defined. And why will that be true? Well, it's because I1 plus I2 is just going to be another element of the ideal capital I, because the ideal is an additive subgroup. Okay, so it's closed under addition. So you can call this I3 if you like. Uh, all you've got here is A plus B plus some element of the ideal, which is exactly something that would be in the same coset as A plus B. If we consider the coset of A plus B, or rather coset of the ideal under A plus B, it will contain things of the form A plus B plus some element of the ideal. I've got something of that form right here. Therefore, this thing is in the same coset as this. And therefore, these two people will conclude that the answer in terms of cosets is exactly the same. Even though they got different answers in the ring, those are in the same coset. So their overall answer, the answer they give back to me in terms of my quotient ring here, would be the same. So indeed, addition is well defined. I think we'll have a break there, and in the next video what we'll do is prove that this addition law does actually obey the five axioms of the Belian group.